We started uh, this particular ranch in 1986 when I got out of college, and uh, Joe and I started dating right after that. And when we got married, uh, Joe left his job at the university and came here full time. And we started with a what's called a commercial cow-calf operation. And those are just the everyday cows you see out in the Flint Hills and, and in any part of the country, really, whose job it is to just have calves, and that generates the beef supply in the U.S. And then in 1993, we also got involved in what's called the seed stock segment of the beef industry, meaning we breed and raise and provide the bulls and replacement females for neighboring ranchers to go back into their herds, bulls that they would use to sire calves with their cows, and then females that they would buy to, to go into their herd and become producing cows. And in 2003, or prior to that, we had been selling bulls private treaty, and in 2003 we had our first production sale. We partnered with some friends of ours, Kevin and Mary Ann Kniebel at the Kniebel Cattle Company. Um, they have red Angus, we have the black Angus, so between the two of us we had enough to have a, a, a good production sale with the bulls and that's, that's where we are now is in our sale ring. Um, and we also sold the, oh each, each ranch sold 30 uh, commercial heifers or pregnant commercial heifers at that time. And we've been doing that, we just had our 10th tenth. Tenth sale. Our 10th yep. annual production sale. Um, and we've been, been pleased with the results and will continue to do that. Um, one thing that makes us a little different than most is on our commercial heifers, we will calve them out for whoever buys those. Um, there is an additional fee for that, but um, so we'll keep those heifers here, calve them out, and, uh, and they'll get a live calf guaranteed as long as we do it. Um, Which once. I don't know of anyone else in the business that's yeah. doing something like that. And when you're calving heifers, for those that, that aren't stockmen, heifers, this is the, that means they have not had their first calf yet. And they are inexperienced. Um, they, they haven't physically gone through the process. So sometimes um, giving birth uh, is, is a little more difficult for them. If you're going to have problems, oftentimes it's with a first calf heifer just because of her um, lack of having gone through the process and her lack of experience. So. As a result of that, part of our job as ranchers and when we're calving out these heifers for our customers is we are literally watching these heifers around the clock so that we can monitor whether or not the birth process is proceeding normally so that we can step in if, if assistance is needed. And to do that, we're checking those heifers throughout the night every three hours. And then if we find something that is starting into labor, if she's very early in labor, we might go ahead and bring her into a pen so we can just watch her, check her. We want to see that she is making good, significant, and proper progress every hour. So we'll check on her every hour. If she is not making the kind of process that we think is necessary for her to get the job done and deliver, deliver a live, healthy calf, then at that point we will step in and offer assistance. And because we're doing that all night and because it requires some experience and, and some knowledge of the process, that's a service that we can offer for our customers who may have an off-farm job, who may have limited experience with this, or they may be at a point in their career where they simply just don't want to do this and they're willing to pay us to do it for them. Well, we're standing in front of uh, some of our bulls for, that were in our sale in uh, November. Another thing we offer is to uh, winter these bulls. Uh, most people do their cow breeding in the summer and early spring or late spring and um, so we're, we're able to, to keep these bulls for them until they're ready to put them to use. Um, these bulls are approaching two years old or are two years old now um, and in our sale we actually sell them as 18 to 20 month old bulls. Uh, some of those will go on to fall cows immediately and fall cows means that those are cows that that have their calves in August and September and sometime in the fall. So their breeding season is uh, November and December typically. And um, more generally for, for the spring calving cows, it's uh, late May, June and July is, is the breeding season. So that's what these guys are getting ready for now. We started in the business with Angus cattle. Angus is what's called a British breed, developed in the British Isles. 
and they were primarily developed as a meat breed and historically and then with development of the breed using all sorts of modern day selection tools the focus of the Angus breed has been a good mother cow that raises a calf that will produce really high quality beef and we use uh, lots of selection tools in developing that high quality beef including ultrasound analysis of cattle and that data is then fed into a large database and, and analyzed for predictability so we can do a better job of selecting bulls that will help us produce really high quality beef like certified Angus beef which is a target we we shoot for we're also using genetic prediction tools. We'll take genetic samples on all of these bulls, like these bulls you see behind me, and send that in. It's analyzed, and then again, that data is fed back to our breed association and used to improve the predictability of the genetics that we're offering. So when a rancher comes in and wants a bull that will help him possibly increase weaning weights and then the size of the ribeye for, for, as an indicator of how much muscling um, that his calves will have, we can point him in the right direction with a higher degree of certainty and help make sure that his valuable investment in an expensive bull takes him in the direction that he wants to go. Our seed stock partners utilize Red Angus, which came from the same base. They are just red in coat color instead of the black that we see behind us. And then their focus, the breeds have been separate for 60 to 70 years, and their focus is just a little bit different, but very much the same. But the, that lets our customers come in and just select from two little bit different gene pools uh, so that, again, we can help them target what their desired endpoint is. And within each breed, there's uh, you know different types of bulls. Some of these are what we call calving ease bulls that uh, will be used on heifers. They will have a lighter birth weight and possibly the shape of the calf will be such that the uh, heifer can give birth easier. And then some of these are, uh, you know, have larger birth weight and they're more for, for cows and they will have a little growthier calf maybe and, um, and have a little more meat on the bone. Some are carcass specialists, so if, if you need to improve the carcass characteristics of your herd, we can help you go that way. Some are what we might call maternal specialists, and we've put extra selection pressure on them so that they're more likely to go sire daughters that, that uh, can handle the range conditions, that can raise a good calf every year, that their udder structure is such that it will hold up till she's 9, 10, 11, 12 years old and be a producing cow in that rancher's herd for a good many years. Our general philosophy and what Joe and I try to do every day in our job as ranchers is to make sure that we are doing the best job that we can by our physical ranch and our resources on the ranch, by the way that we treat and handle our cattle, by the way we manage our cattle, everything. We've got an eye to, can we do this better? Just because we've done it this way for 10 years, does that not mean that there's something better out there? So we're always kind of filtering and, and looking for better ways to do things, constantly reading, constantly researching. Um, I know right now in, in this climate, there is a lot of focus on antibiotic use and hormone use in beef cattle. And there's sometimes a misperception out there that, uh, that we as ranchers and beef producers are using antibiotics to overcome poor management practices. And I just like to give everyone there a little bit of insight into how we use antibiotics on our ranch. First of all, we use it to treat a clinically sick animal. Um, way behind me, we've got a calf that has terrible scours, terrible diarrhea, and anyone with a baby knows that uh, very quickly they can get out of whack and it be can become a life-threatening situation if those conditions aren't treated. So we did in fact treat that calf for this infection under the supervision of a veterinarian. So we're using antibiotics in that way. Another way that we do use antibiotics on a daily basis in the summertime, we use a little chlorotetracycline in the mineral that we offer to our cattle. The mineral is just vitamins and minerals like, like what I say, but we add some chlorotetracycline to that because we have an organism in Kansas called anaplasmosis and actually throughout the whole Midwest that can cause terrible anemia and death in cattle. To me, it, it's like, it would be like sending your kids into Africa without preventative malarial treatments. 
It's the same way for these cattle out grazing these Flint Hills. It would be irresponsible of me to go ahead and let these cattle develop a life-threatening illness, have to treat them with clinical levels of antibiotics when I can prevent them from getting sick in the first place. So that's another way we use antibiotics on the ranch. We do use some hormones judiciously in the development of our cattle. And the analogy to me there is fuel efficiency in your car. I can get you from point A to point B two different ways. In one way, I can use less gasoline, cause less environmental consequences because of it. The other way, I have to go slower, a few more, um, you know, a little more waste in the environment, and I go, like I said, slower. So, um, you know, the hormones that we use, again, have been well researched, well documented. We do go both ways. It's, it's all dependent on what the consumer wants. But still, the largest driver for most people is the price of the product. And to do that, we work very, efficient, very efficiently and in a safe uh, manner that, that is under the supervision of USDA and FDA. Yeah, about 10 years ago, we had an employee that introduced us to a, uh, a low-stress handling system d developed by Bud Williams down in Texas. And um, we've implemented that. and. Uh, wholeheartedly believe in it. Uh, we use it on every aspect of what we do here. Um, from working newborn calves, we'll, uh, we tag these calves at birth, uh, dip their navel with iodine, um, weigh them, and, uh, and we'll just rub them all over and let them know that we're not hurting them and that uh, we are not a predator. Um, and then a few months later, when we're weaning these calves, our facilities are designed in a low-stress manner also. We'll train these calves um, to follow each other and we'll get them headed in the right direction and back off and just let them go. And uh, we do have to run them through the chute to give them a vaccination, but uh, we use what's called a bud box, which is kind of a dead end alley where they walk down and have to come back and will just kind of naturally flow into to where they need to go. We also use low stress in moving cattle from pasture to pasture. We, uh, we may apply a little pressure in the opposite direction that we want to go, and then we'll release that pressure. And once these cattle start moving the direction we want them to go, we, we just back off and let them go. It's not all quiet, you know, no hooping and hollering, and uh, we want them to, to feel like they're moving on their own and we're just kind of along for the ride. Yeah, over and over again, we've done such that these cattle know we'll apply pressure, we're asking for movement, they'll give it to us, and our way of telling them you just did the right thing is to remove that pressure. And they go, okay, they relax and they just keep going. And it's just like training a horse. I always say no one would ever expect to get on a horse that has not been trained to do what you want to do and expect to get a job done. Well, it's the same way with cattle. A little bit of training that they know the system. Here's the pressure, okay, start the movement, back off, I'm doing it right. Just a little, small bit of training like that goes a long way into handling these animals properly and with no stress. Uh, we're standing at what is called a controlled access drinking point. And what we've done here since we've been so dry the last three years is uh, taken what used to be an old pond and rehabbed it into a new one. And um, this pond is gonna be completely fenced off to the cattle except for where we're at right now and also for another point on the other side. We made a, uh, about a four to one slope on this area and then laid down some geotextile fabric and applied, oh, six to eight inches of a coarse rock on top of that. Um, the geotextile fabric keeps that rock in place. It doesn't allow the cattle to mush it into the mud. And it's also rough enough that the cattle will come in here, get their drink and not Mill, mill around on it too much. They'll get their drink and, and go back out to grazing or somewhere where it's more comfortable to stand. Um, but the, if the important feature of it is that this is the only place that the cattle can get into the water. If they were able to go along a, a dirt bank, they would eventually push that dirt bank down and cause a big mud flat to form. Um, and they'd have to keep going farther and farther out into the pond and the pond would keep eroding more and more. And, uh, and eventually it would get unusable. Um, and then when you have a dry year like we're in, those mud flats become very dangerous places for the cattle and places where they can bog down, get stuck, um, and then you are in a risky situation trying to free them that can become very dangerous to people and the cattle. So this, this will help us improve the life of the pond, 
It will help us control water quality. It will help us provide a real nice wildlife habitat uh, situation. And it will help us have better water resources in dry years that are usable for everything, cattle, for recreation, for wildlife. Yeah, the pasture we're in now is, is a uh, real favorite of the prairie chickens around here. Uh, we try to maintain our pastures in the, in the fashion that they've been done for, for hundreds of years. We do burn pastures. We also have a tree shear to, uh, to keep trees and uh, we do spray some brush. Um, this pasture, however, since it is a favorite of the prey chickens, we probably will not be burning it this year. Uh, habitat is really short this year for prey chickens, so we'll be leaving this one so that they can do their booming and nesting out here and, um, and hopefully bring their numbers back up. They've been going down for the last 20 years or so in this area, and we'd like to see them come back. One of the coolest things I think about our job is that we are so tied to nature and the cycles of nature and and the seasons every year and as, as ranchers we're out here every day and I think we're maybe some of the best bellwethers of the health of the ecosystem because we are so closely connected to it and we see it all the time. We're one of the first to know if something's off and we're also one of the first lines of defense for our native wildlife and, and you know we're not the exception. Um, when Joe's talking about he's got a soft spot for the wildlife on the ranch and, and we change our management practices to favor that wildlife, uh, that's what all of the ranchers we, we know do. They're an important part um, of our everyday existence and one of the things that we love about ranching, you know, we raise our family here, this is our office, um, this will be our kids inheritance someday and we absolutely love this ranch want to see it go forward in the future and and be how it should be uh, be do it right